Good afternoon, and welcome to the webinar, Making Your Case, Evidence-Based Prosecution. My name is Emily Thresh, and I'm the Project Coordinator here at Equitas, the Prosecutor's Resource on Violence Against Women. I will be moderating today's webinar. This webinar will focus on evidence-based considerations, investigative techniques, and trial strategies. Before we begin the substantive portion of our program, I'll go over a few logistical notes. If you do have any problems, please contact Island directly and the numbers on your screen, that 800 number. If you're using the internet audio option, we do recommend you dialing in with the phone number and you should be able to see the phone number listed in the public chat portion. Um, we have the private chat enabled for participants to send me any messages that you might have, uh, questions, clarifications for our presenter today, um, and I will share that with him. Uh, if he can, he'll get to it during the webinar, otherwise we'll follow up with you after the webinar is over. Today's webinar is hosted by Equitas, the Prosecutor's Resource on Violence Against Women, through funding from the U.S. Department of Justice, Office on Violence Against Women. The written materials, including a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and our presenter's biography, will be emailed to you after the presentation. In addition, we are recording today's webinar for later viewing. Equitas' mission is to improve the quality of justice in sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, and human trafficking cases by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. Equitas' staff is comprised of former prosecutors with over 100 years of collective experience who conduct legal research, provide 24-7 case consultation, and serve as mentors and instructors, as well as publish re resources. Today's presenter is John Wilkinson, an attorney advisor here at Equitas. John has presented extensively on the investigation and prosecution of domestic violence, stalking, sexual violence, and human trafficking, both in the U.S. and abroad. Prior to working with Equitas, John was a program manager for the Gun Violence Prosecution Program, part of the Homeland Security Program and Southwest Border Crime Program of the National District Attorneys Association. From 1998 through 2005, John serves as an assistant Commonwealth attorney in Fredericksburg, Virginia, prosecuting cases involving intimate partner violence and sexual assault, including cases of campus sexual assault and domestic violence homicide. John's full biography will be emailed to you following the webinar, along with a PDF of today's PowerPoint presentation. I will now turn over the floor to John for the substantive portion of our presentation. Thanks, Emily. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us for Making Your Case, uh, Evidence-Based Prosecution. Uh, in domestic violence cases is uh, what we're going to primarily be talking about today. Uh, and of course, we think about going forward in uh, domestic violence cases in particular, not just domestic violence cases, but those in particular, because those are the cases we often do not have our victim participating with us sometimes come time for trial. Uh, so after today's presentation, we will be better able to build a case that doesn't rely entirely on the victim's testimony at trial. We investigate and prosecute these cases anticipating that we may not have the victim with us, but we often do have the victim with us. Uh, there are plenty of times we will not, uh, and we want to be ready to go forward if, it, if we can in any way possible. We'll also be better able to identify additional sources of corroborating evidence, things that corroborate the victim's statement, things that corroborate the crime. We have to thoroughly investigate these cases to identify that information. That's the only way we're going to be able to go forward with or without the victim with us if we thoroughly investigate. You almost approach these cases like you would a homicide case. Uh, that's the other case where we know we are not going to have the victim testifying our, on our behalf. And homicide cases get thoroughly investigated. These cases need to be thoroughly investigated as well. So we want to think about that as we're going forward. We'll also be better able to present expert testimony to explain victim behavior. Often in domestic violence cases, also sexual violence cases, stalking and human trafficking cases, basically violence against women cases, the thing that people get hung up on is victim behavior. They don't understand why victims uh, behave the way they do after the trauma of domestic violence or sexual violence, and we have to explain it to them. We can't take for granted that people are going to understand that. We have to proactively anticipate that and strategize about how we're going to educate our fact finders, whether it's a judge or whether it's a jury, about why victims behave the way they do after they suffer this trauma. And there are some common behaviors that we see routinely, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and there are things that we don't always see. But expert testimony is one strategy, not the only strategy, but one strategy to explain victim behavior to a fact finder so they understand the context of domestic violence 
and they don't make false credibility assessments about victims simply because they don't understand how victims behave after this trauma of domestic violence. We'll also be better able to conduct effective direct and cross-examination of victims who minimize or recant or end up testifying for the defense, all things that happen if you're doing domestic violence cases. So we're going to talk about all of these things as we go through this presentation. Okay. Uh, so what are the greatest challenges in domestic violence cases? These uh, domestic violence cases are some of the toughest cases that we'll face as prosecutors. They're also some of the most frustrating cases, and it's often related uh, to victim behavior, victims that we're trying to help but seemingly either don't want the help or are not participating or cooperating with us in those cases. And if we understand what's going on in domestic violence, they become far less frustrating and they become cases that we can strategize about how to go forward. So some of the, the two biggest things going on I think of are power and control. That's what these cases are all about. It is the abuser is trying to gain power and control over the victim. The power and control wheel uh, tells us a whole bunch of things about uh, how these uh, exercises go on, um, whether they're using male privilege, whether they're using uh, some sort of threat, some physical violence, whether they're uh, using kids against them, whether they're minimizing about what they've done. The abuser is engaging in an exercise of power and control. There's also witness intimidation that uh, bears on these cases powerfully. Um, witness intimidation, I think of as a broad umbrella term that includes a lot of behaviors. Uh, it can be physical violence, it can be threats, uh, things like that, but it can also be that wooing or that, uh, you know, hey, I, I love you, I'm going to change, please don't call the police or please don't show up at court, things like that, that manipulation that abusers engage in to gain, again, power and control over their victim. So, they engage in all of these types of tactics so that they'll be able to control the person that they seek to abuse. Uh, and it's very effective. And so we have to think about ways we can overcome these uh, dynamics to go forward successfully, whether we have the victim with us or not. All right, so some of these challenges that present in these cases in particular, there's trauma associated with domestic violence. And anybody who's worked with those victims knows that they suffer trauma from being in an abusive relationship. I, you know, I always just sort of think about when I go home, the home is a place of solace for me. It's a place to relax, to be yourself, to just sort of uh, not have to do anything but relax. Uh, but for domestic violence victims, that's not the same situation. That is a place where they have to be on edge. They have to be careful. Uh, it is not a place of solace. They may not have a place of solace. Work or other places might become that place, and it's not – the same as when we go home. So there's trauma associated with this when there's threats and violence and things of that nature. It causes trauma, it inflicts trauma, and that causes different behaviors uh, uh, in victims. Uh, victims often recant in these cases, and they're not recanting because uh, they don't like the police or prosecutors or they're trying to protect the abuser necessarily. They're recanting because they're basically forced. It's a self-preservation mechanism. It's a way to protect themselves, and they're trying to do the best safest thing for them. And sometimes they do know the safest way to do it. Not always, uh, but sometimes they do. So that, these are all safety tactics. Minimizing what happened is another safety tactic, and we might call that the soft recant. You know, when you get a victim who gave the initial report, but then when it comes time to testify at court, it just wasn't, oh, it wasn't that bad, I was upset, and I exaggerated, uh, and he didn't really hit me hard, or he didn't throw me hard, or push me hard, things like that. So those are challenges. Judges and juries who rely on myths, uh, you know, things like, boy, if, if someone was abusive to me, I'd leave the relationship immediately. Well, we know that doesn't happen. That's not how these relationships work, but that's what people think. Um, I'd call the police immediately. I would testify. I'd participate in the investigation and prosecution of the case. Those are things people think happen in these cases, and we know that's not how it works. And so we have to make sure that they're educated about how domestic violence actually works. Um, Victims become unavailable. They fail to appear at trial or they refuse to testify. Uh, that's a challenge also, and we have to think of ways to overcome that. Uh, and we have to do it in a victim-centered way, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so all of these things are challenges when we're dealing with these cases. When we recognize these challenges, we can then strategize about how to overcome these challenges without doing more harm to the victim, because we want to always have the victim foremost uh, in our thoughts and our approach. 
Uh, and we always have to remember all those challenges, they're caused by the offender. He is the one who is responsible for the victim's trauma and fear. He is the one who has caused them uh, to behave in this way. Uh, so keep that in mind, and that helps us be more victim-centered. Being victim-centered to me, it's just remembering that the victim is at the center of these cases. They play a central role in what we're doing. Uh, most of our cases, when we think about domestic violence, it's difficult to go forward if we don't have the victim present. There are ways we can go forward without a victim, but we, our first duty is to make sure the victim gets the support necessary and to engage the victim so that they do participate in the investigation and prosecution of the case. If we can have them there, that's the best way to go forward. If we can't have them there, then let's prepare each case as if we're not going to have a victim present and see if we can go forward without them. But they do play a central role. And we always want to have their safety, their privacy, and their well-being at the center of our thoughts when we're going forward. So thinking about what we're doing and how it impacts the victim is important. Forcing a victim to take the stand uh, when they don't want to, arresting victims, things like that, that's typically not going to be in a victim's best interest. That's not going to be uh, considering the well-being of the victim. That is uh, sometimes just something we do because we always uh, arrest people who don't uh, appear in court when they've been subpoenaed. That's not something we want to do in these cases. It's not achieving any goal of the criminal justice system. Um, I can't say there wouldn't be a case with a, a super dangerous abuser that we might need to consider uh, making sure the victim is present uh, to go forward in, in, at trial. But routinely, we do not want to be doing that, do not want to be punishing victims. And we want to be coordinated with our allied professionals so that we are giving the victim what they need in a meaningful way, that they have access to services and support. Making us, giving the victim the support they need is going to make a better witness for us. So those are the first things we want to think about. The victim needs to be more than just a case. They want to be safe and they want to feel safe. They also need to be informed about what's going on in the case. Sometimes that can be uh, very important and it gives them uh, some engagement in the case. So we want to pay attention, keep the victims informed about what we're doing. Uh, they also want to regain some control over their lives. When you're in that relationship, you lose some of that control, some of that autonomy, and so we want to replace that. We definitely don't want to do things that harm the victim. We want to be victim-centered and make sure we can hold the offender accountable without injuring our victims. So one of the ways we want to think about that is doing an evidence-based case. We want to start with a thorough investigation, document everything possible, build all the evidence we can, and then see if it's possible for us to go forward, even if the victim uh, is not participating. Evidence-based just means building and presenting a case in which we can hold offenders accountable for their behavior with or without the victim's testimony. Uh, sometimes we can get that testimony in through the victim testifying themselves. Other times there may be exceptions uh, to the hearsay rule that allow us to get a victim's statement in even if the victim is not present, and we'll talk about that. This is a policy from Duluth, Minnesota, um, who has Duluth has done tremendous work in the area of domestic violence. And the one line from this that I think is so important to think about when we're doing these cases, when we're doing domestic violence cases, we really want to approach them in much the same way we do sexual assault cases, where we have a sexual assault response team. We want to work closely with our allied professionals, police, prosecutors, advocacy, and medical uh, in a domestic assault response team. And the key is the investigation, and that's where it begins. And from Duluth's policy, they say, the investigation of these cases sets the foundation for almost every subsequent action by the courts and community-based agencies. So what they're saying is these cases will go down one of a, a few paths, and the investigation really determines which path it's going to go down. If it's a thorough investigation, then hopefully it's going to go down the right path to holding that offender accountable and maintaining that victim's safety and privacy and well-being. And that's what we need. We need these cases to be as thoroughly investigated as possible. Even though they're sometimes frustrating, even though sometimes the victim uh, does not want to participate in that investigation, that's where these cases begin. It may be too late by the time a prosecutor sees a case if it hasn't been thoroughly investigated. We may have missed that opportunity. I often think about the scene of the domestic violence uh, incident as having that sort of golden hour that we think about in uh, medical treatment. You have an, an hour to do 
uh, what you can to save this individual. And in these cases, that at the scene, you sort of have that hour where victims are going to be most forthcoming about what happened, and they're going to be most receptive about the resources we have to offer them to support them. And so we want to get as much information out of them as we can then and flood them with as many resources as possible. And that's going to be the best way to go forward in these cases. So that's an important uh, time period right then and there. Slowly but surely, victims start to respond to the pressure that the abuser puts on them, and it's difficult for them to continue to participate in the case. So we want to give them as much support as possible. So for an evidence-based case, we have to collect as much evidence as possible. And some of the, the things that we think are obvious, we just want to do routinely. Collect the 911 call if it exists. Make sure it's preserved. Uh, make sure we have it for, uh, in evidence. Those statements on, nine, on a 911 call are almost always going to be admissible, whether the victim uh, is present at trial or not. And so they can have valuable information about the assault. They can have valuable information about the victim's uh, Demeanor, sometimes you can hear a defendant on those calls. So those are things that we want to preserve and uh, introduce at trial. Uh, we always want to get victim statement. We always want to get an offender statement where they're willing to give a statement. Uh, and then think about others who might be present, a neighbor, children, uh, other witnesses, family members that can also give us uh, evidence about not just what happened during this incident, the four corners of this incident, but maybe a little bit about what's the history of this relationship, because that's really going to be the key to being successful in a domestic violence case, is knowing what the history of the relationship is. If you're trying these cases on the four corners of an incident on one day, one afternoon, one evening, that's going to be tough to demonstrate that this was not just an argument gone bad, but this is actually a pattern of abuse. This is power and control at work, not just uh, an argument that escalated. Uh, and the history of the relationship is what tells us that. You may not always get that history in, but it's informative for us to determine how dangerous is this individual. When we're trying to determine how serious a case is and how dangerous an individual is, we also want to think about using danger assessments, lethality instruments, uh, to gauge how dangerous the case is. If we're not doing that, if someone in our jurisdiction, if someone in our domestic assault response team is not administering danger assessments with our victims, we're missing an opportunity to protect victims, and we're also missing an opportunity to gather even more information about the case. And it helps us, even if we can't introduce it at trial, it helps us understand how dangerous an individual is or how dangerous a situation is for a victim. And we might want to provide more support, more resources to that victim, and we might want to respond to that defendant differently as far as bail or bond or certain conditions of no contact. Uh, or monitoring their uh, whereabouts. Uh, the crime scene, of course, is going to be an important uh, piece of evidence, and we always want to document whatever the crime scene looks like. We can always document it in writing in a police report, but why not just get photographs, collect evidence that uh, indicates that there was an altercation, uh, look to statements about uh, where this happened, when it happened, what happened, uh, document everything. Photos of the victim, photos of any injuries, photo of clothing photos of demeanor. If your jurisdiction is now using body-worn cameras, they can be a great way to document some of these things, any injuries, that demeanor, the demeanor of the victim, the demeanor of the offended, the offender or the accused. Um, we also, if we're using body-worn cameras, we want to think carefully about how we're using them, how it impacts victims uh, of these cases. And if we're doing anything like using a Lethal, like the Maryland lethal, Lethality Assessment Program, the LAP program that uh, officers on the scene administer to victims, we definitely don't want that conversation captured on a body-worn camera. Uh, anything that involves victim safety, anything that involves victims talking with advocates, I don't want that captured on a body-worn camera. That could put place a victim at risk. So let's make sure we either have a policy or a thoughtful use of body-worn cameras in these situations. We want photos of the defendant, any injury that he may have or any lack of injury that he may have. Sometimes the defendant may have injuries. Sometimes uh, the injuries indicate that uh, it was something the victim did to defend herself or himself. I'm probably going to refer to the victim as, as her and she during this presentation, which doesn't mean there aren't uh, men who are victims of domestic violence as well. Uh, it happens both ways, but the vast majority of our victims are women.
Um, so uh, is it an injury that was inflicted because the victim was trying to protect herself, uh, defend herself, um, or is it an injury that uh, we need to pay more attention to? Uh, is there a lack of injury? And do we get uh, some demeanor evidence uh, about the defendant, uh, either through body-worn camera video or just taking pictures of him? Medical records can also be instructive and helpful, uh, making sure that we get the medical records from this incident, but also thinking about what prior incidents have there been uh, that maybe weren't reported to police, and medical records exist when a victim went to the hospital or to a dentist uh, to receive treatment because of a previous assault. Um, so some of these things are going to be very important. There's a really good, if, if anybody wants it, uh, we, we can share it with them. There's a really good uh, police report. It's a supplemental domestic violence report out of Virginia Beach, Virginia, from their Commonwealth Attorney's Office. And uh, it's really comprehensive and covers all the things you'd want to cover if you're investigating a domestic violence case. So it includes things like a body map that, to document injuries, a place for a statement for the victim, a statement for the defendant, was alcohol being used? Uh, was there strangulation? And then what are the indicators of strangulation? Uh, so it's a really comprehensive uh, report form. It's about four pages. It's meant to be supplemental, but it gets you wouldn't have to know anything about domestic violence in particular. If you just follow this form, you're going to collect a lot of valuable information about a domestic violence case. Uh, so something else to think about. All right, so what evidence is there to establish the history of the relationship? which, again, is going to be key in these cases. Often that's a history that we can get into evidence. Uh, even if we can't get into evidence, it's going to be informative uh, for us as investigators and prosecutors to figure out what's going on, and for advocates and medical also uh, to determine what support, what counseling, what services a victim may need uh, in these cases. So that history of the relationship is really important. Uh, so other police reports. Uh, where the offender and the victim are both uh, uh, involved in a, an incident. Um, what 911 calls do we have? What other police reports do we have, even if a case didn't go forward? Are there civil protection orders involved? Uh, and what does the affidavit of the civil protective order say that the victim said has been happening? Uh, that's going to be informative for us. Other case files where a case has been investigated or where uh, charges were filed and we maybe went forward and had a not guilty or we were unable to go forward for whatever reason, uh, that case file may have uh, important information in it. Criminal histories obviously uh, can be helpful, um, but criminal histories don't always contain all the information. And so statements from those family, friends, coworkers, whoever might know the history of the relationship, that might even be more informative. There may be prior incidents that could still be chargeable, uh, and we want to know about those as well. Even if they're not chargeable, they may be uh, able to be introduced into evidence as prior crimes or other acts evidence, that 404B evidence that uh, is so important in domestic violence cases. Medical records, dental records, any time a victim has received treatment in the past for an incident that may not have been reported, uh, they may tell us about that now. And prior relationships, I mostly think about the offender when I'm thinking about prior relationships because I tend to think these guys are just abusive it's nothing to do with this particular victim. They are abusive. They must control their uh, significant other. And um, so that probably occurred in a prior relationship as well. And if we can track that evidence down, that could be powerful 404B evidence as well. So we want to think about all the historical evidence we can to determine what was going on in this relationship. And is there any evidence that's going to be relevant to this particular prosecution? Or are there other cases that can still be charged uh, and we can go forward from the past that were simply never reported until now because we're the, this is the first time we asked about it. Social media, what does that tell us about the relationship? Uh, what does that tell us about this case? Uh, is the offender trying to reach a victim that they're ordered to have no contact with via social media or via their friends on social media if they're not doing it uh, directly? Uh, do, are they having contact with the victim uh, or an advocate? Is the victim having uh, uh contact um, so that uh, they're getting the support they uh, need. Uh, follow up with family, friends, and neighbors. That can help us um, determine what's going on. Jail phone calls are a rich source of evidence in these cases. If you're able to have that offender held in jail pending trial or if they can't make the bail that uh, is set in this case, they're going to reach out to that victim and they're going to do it typically via jail phone call. 
And if it's not through their own jail number because their PIN has been blocked or that number has been blocked for the victim, they'll reach them through uh, a, a fellow inmate, something like that. So we want to be vigilant about looking for jail phone calls from an incarcerated individual to that victim uh, because that's where you're going to find the evidence of intimidation, of manipulation that they're trying to affect the case that way. And that's good evidence of consciousness of guilt. Why are you asking someone not to show up if you didn't do anything wrong? Why are you trying to pressure them to drop charges or not talk to the prosecutor uh, if you've done nothing wrong? That's a, a really rich source of evidence. It can also be a basis for a motion for forfeiture by wrongdoing, which we'll also talk about in a minute, uh, which is the theory where if we can demonstrate that the, the defendant did something to prevent the witness from testifying or a victim from testifying, then we can introduce those statements if we can prove that they intended to do that. And jail phone calls are often good evidence of that. And weapons are important, too. We should be asking at every domestic violence scene about weapons, even if they weren't used in this particular case. But if they were used, let's seize those weapons, and let's make sure that we have some sort of firearms surrender protocol. And, of course, I'm talking particularly about firearms in this instance. But what happens in a case where the offender has weapons or used weapons, either threatening with it or something else. Uh, do we just let them keep those weapons? We know that that is a very dangerous situation where you have a weapon in the home and a domestic abuser in the home. So we should be actively inquiring about weapons, and we should have in place some sort of firearm surrender protocol in our jurisdiction where offenders who are either convicted of domestic violence or are subject to a domestic violence protective order are required to surrender those firearms or in some way dispossess themselves of those firearms. If they don't turn them into law enforcement, they have to get rid of them, and then we have to verify that. So those are things that we want to think about. We want to have that team that I've talked about, and we want to be cooperating. These are the main players in that team, your law enforcement, your prosecution, your advocacy or service providers, and your medical uh, folks. Medical folks are an important part of a domestic assault response team. Uh, they Victims are often coming to medical without reporting to police. They can provide support services. Uh, they can also document injuries, uh, gather evidence that is helpful to a domestic violence prosecution. We should all be working, just like in a sexual assault response team, we should be working collaboratively to make sure that we're getting the best evidence possible, that everybody's on the same page, and that we're providing the support that victims need. All right, so if we are going to go forward without a victim, are there ways to get a victim statement, their account of what happened into evidence when we don't have that victim present? And so, of course, we're going to immediately think about hearsay exceptions. And these are just a handful of commonly used hearsay exceptions when we're talking about domestic violence cases. Uh, all these are in, allowed to be introduced because they are considered trustworthy. And the main one that we typically use in domestic violence cases is the excited utterance. And, of course, that is just simply when a victim makes an excited utterance, uh, they're under the grip of some startling event, uh, and they're telling you about that event, uh, and that is a typical hearsay exception. And one way to get a victim statement into evidence is through excited utterance. Uh, then existing mental, emotional, or physical condition is another one, where the victim is relaying some mental or emotional situation or a physical condition, my head hurts, um, you know, indicating that uh, they were struck or there was an assault or an altercation, things like that. Uh, medical treatment or diagnosis. Any statements a victim makes for the purposes of medical diagnosis or treatment uh, are admissible as a hearsay uh, exception. Um, and they're considered reliable because we believe people tell their doctors the truth about what happened to them or what they're suffering from. And so that can be a source of information that can be introduced if we don't have the victim present. And a present sense impression is just uh, when someone relays an event as it's happening or immediately after it happened. It's just sort of the classic, he's at the 40, he's at the 30, he's at the 20. You know, he's going, somebody relaying events. It could be a neighbor who's witnessing an assault and say, oh, my gosh, he's hitting her on the front lawn, something like that. So we want to keep in mind these classic hearsay exceptions. There's many others that may apply, but these are ones that we commonly uh, use. Even if we have a hearsay exception that Statements of a victim may not be admissible if they're considered testimonial as opposed to non-testimonial. And the Crawford v. Washington case from 2004 laid out those uh, requirements. Uh, testimonial 
statements are typically more formal. They're typically made to a government agent, agent such as law enforcement, and their primary purpose is for use in a later prosecution. And it's just the classic situation of the law enforcement officer saying, give me the facts about what happened, and we know they're going to use those facts to prosecute somebody, to apprehend and prosecute somebody. Uh, so those are testimonial statements, and those are statements that require the victim be present and testify about them uh, if the statements are testimonial. So a statement made to a detective, uh, testimony at a pretrial hearing, uh, deposition uh, testimony, things that are very formal, uh, things that are being made because we're trying to prosecute somebody, made to a government agent, those are going to be testimonial and they require that the victim be present or that there have been a previous opportunity, uh, a previous time that the victim testified with an opportunity for cross-examination. Non-testimonial statements are basically any other statements that are not testimonial. Uh, so casual remarks to non-law enforcement, non-government agents, uh, statements to medical professionals are typically non-testimonial. And then there is one exception to law enforcement, and that's statements that are made during an ongoing emergency that are made to enable the police to meet and address that ongoing emergency. So a 911 call is almost always going to be made during an emergency. Not always, but almost always. Or statements to an officer who arrives at the scene where a victim is telling them about what's happening and the officer needs those statements to address that ongoing emergency, the ongoing assault. If the assault is over, it may not be an ongoing emergency, but any statements made during an ongoing emergency are going to be important. So when we're thinking about trying to go forward in these cases, we really want to identify sources of non-testimonial hearsay. That's statements that are going to be able to come in with a hearsay exception that don't require the victim to be present and testify about it. So one good question for law enforcement to ask victims at the scene now is, did you call anybody or talk to anybody immediately before or immediately after you called the police? So what we're doing there is trying to identify a source of non-testimonial hearsay, someone who can testify. Did you call your sister? Did you call a family member? Did you call a neighbor, a friend? And they encourage you to call the police because they maybe told that individual what happened during the assault, and it is so close in time to the assault that the hearsay exception will be an excited utterance. Or if, you, if you're talking about another incident that wasn't reported to police, just asking, hey, back during that incident, did you talk to anybody immediately after the assault? And maybe they called somebody to get encouragement or help. And that might be a case that could be charged. And even if the victim doesn't participate, then uh, we might have that source of non-testimonial hearsay. So we want to identify those sources of non-testimonial hearsay when we're going forward. It's going to be very helpful uh, in these cases. Uh, testimonial hearsay may be admissible if the victim testifies, if the victim previously testified and the defense had the opportunity for a full and fair cross-examination. Uh, so think about this when you, if you have a felony domestic violence case and you're going to have a preliminary hearing, do I want to give the defense a little more leeway uh, for their cross-examination of my victim at this juncture? Do I want to provide them with all the discovery, all the exculpatory information I have prior to that preliminary hearing because I'm afraid I'm going to lose my victim before trial time and this will be a way to preserve their testimony and give that defense attorney a full and fair opportunity to cross-examine them. If they don't have all the information necessary for a full and fair cross-examination, that may not survive uh, in uh, circuit court or upstairs in the felony court when it comes time for trial. So they have to have that full fair opportunity. So think about that as a strategy or if there was a prior opportunity to cross-examine this individual through either a, a, some sort of deposition or a previous trial or something like that, um, then we want to uh, make sure that we have access to that and we can use that if we don't have our victim. And forfeiture by wrongdoing is the other way that testimonial hearsay can be admitted, um, and we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Um, and again, it's the theory that um, if the, if the defendant has done something wrong to prevent the victim from testifying, and now we're going to allow those statements to come in. All right, so witness intimidation is uh, ever-present in these cases, and we want to pay attention to it because I think it's something that we sometimes take for granted. We kind of know that an offender is going to be in contact with the victim. We kind of know they're going to manipulate or try and intimidate the victim, and we can do a better job in preparing victims for that and strategizing about how we're going to address intimidation in our system. Uh, just a quick study from 1996 
uh, urban criminal justice professionals identified that victims uh, were intimidated in domestic violence cases each year, more so than in gang or drug crime, the other crimes that we think intimidation happens a lot, but domestic violence even more. And they were at a particular risk for retaliation and intimidation when living with or economically dependent on the offender uh, or when they engage in shared parenting. So domestic violence is certainly ripe for intimidation. This is a great quote from 1995. Uh, Only unsuccessful intimidation ever came to the attention of police or prosecutors. And of course, if it's unsuccessful, they're going to tell us about it. If it's successful, we never hear about it because we don't hear from our victim again. So just a, a great little quote there. So if we have intimidation going on, what are we doing to recognize it? Are we educating victims that, hey, he may be in contact with you. He may try and intimidate you. He may try and manipulate you. That is evidence of a crime. That is evidence that is valuable to our prosecution. Please preserve any evidence of that that you get and alert us immediately. Uh, We want to coordinate with our allied professionals to recognize this. We want to protect victims. I'm sure many of you have had cases where right in the courthouse or in the courtroom, Offenders have been trying to intimidate victims with a stare, with a word, with a look. Uh, Let's not have that go on if we can. Let's have a way to train courtroom personnel. Let's not just rely on advocates to put themselves in harm's way and physically get between the victim and the offender who's trying to intimidate them, which happens all the time. Uh, It shouldn't be on just the advocate. We should have a system in place to make sure in those areas that we control, intimidation is not going on, and everybody can play a role in that. Uh, We want to have safety plans for our victims so that they can get out of harm's way if necessary. And we want to limit the opportunities for offenders to intimidate victims. So maybe have posters in the courthouse that say intimidation is a crime, intimidating a witness is a crime, and we have zero tolerance for it here. Uh, We want to make sure that the victim can alert police so that we have regular contact with victim and witnesses, particularly prosecutors. Think about when you're meeting with the victim, you might be the last person who's talking to them before trial. Uh, often it's happening in the courthouse, but sometimes we, we're also meeting with victims prior to trial, particularly in felony domestic violence cases. And that might, we might want to inquire about, how's your safety plan? Has anything changed? Has he gotten out? Has he been in contact with you? Uh, we also want to look for those jail phone calls. They're, they're valuable. Uh, we want to document intimidation as well. That's going to be important, not just for consciousness of guilt, which is also important at trial, but also if we're going to file a motion for forfeiture by wrongdoing. Uh, That documented intimidation is going to be important, and so we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's what forfeiture by wrongdoing is. Many states and the federal uh, jurisdictions have codified it as an exception to the rule against hearsay. Uh, And so this is the federal rule. It's a statement offered against the party that wrongfully caused or acquiesced in wrongfully causing the declarant's unavailability as a witness and did so intending that result. So you basically have to show three things. One, that the victim's unavailable. So what does that mean? It means, one, we've done our due diligence to try and obtain that victim's presence at trial, uh, meaning we've subpoenaed them, we've been in contact with them, we're uh, trying to make it uh, able for them to participate in the trial and attend uh, court. Um, If we're not subpoenaing victims, which some jurisdictions do, Uh, recognizing that uh, they're not going to punish victims for failure to appear and they don't want courts to sua sponte on their own uh, punish victims uh, who fail to appear for court. But if we're not, forfeiture by wrongdoing is not going to be available. We have to exercise due diligence to obtain their presence. A victim is unavailable if they fail to appear, if they refuse to testify. Of course, uh, a victim who is a victim of homicide is uh, always unavailable. Uh, So those are our unavailable victims. What is the defendant's wrongdoing? Um, That could be intimidation, threats. It could also be uh, things like, baby, please don't show up to court. If you don't show, they can't get me. That's wrongdoing under that umbrella of uh, wrongdoing. Um, And so we should look for that as well. And intended to make the victim unavailable. So if it's don't show up to court, that's an easy one. That is clear to uh, demonstrate that intent. If you show up, I'll, I'll beat the hell out of you. That's easy to spot. It's not always easy to recognize or demonstrate that intent, uh, particularly if there isn't an ongoing case. And forfeiture is still available uh, even if there wasn't an ongoing case at the time. Um, so we want to think about that uh, as well. But that's basically the three things you have to show to establish forfeiture by wrongdoing. And when we're doing these cases, 
particularly felony cases, we want to make sure that we have a file on each witness that, you know, like you normally would in doing your trial prep, that includes, uh, you know, the, maybe a, a witness's record, maybe the things I'm going to uh, talk to the witness about, um, evidence related to this victim's testimony. Now we want to also have a forfeiture file for those witnesses. What's the evidence that the witness is being intimidated? And if the witness doesn't show or the victim doesn't show, can I do an oral motion for forfeiture by wrongdoing? Those are things we want to think about. So some of the advantages to forfeiture by wrongdoing, you have to have a, a hearing, and um, in that hearing, in almost every state, the burden of proof is preponderance of the evidence. Not every state has a codified statutory exception uh, to the hearsay rule based on forfeiture by wrongdoing. Many states do. Um, many states have case law authority for forfeiture by wrongdoing. Every jurisdiction that's looked at forfeiture has approved it. Um, some states just simply don't have statutes or case law on it. It doesn't mean you can't do it, and there are typically prosecutors who are engaging in for, or filing forfeiture by wrongdoing motions, uh, even though there's no specific authority to their jurisdiction. So it can be done. The only jurisdiction I'm aware of where forfeiture, to, forfeiture does not operate as a, an exception to the rule against hearsay is Colorado. It only extinguishes the right to confront and cross exist confront the witness against you. You forfeit your right of confrontation under forfeiture in Colorado, but there still has to be a hearsay exception. Everywhere else that's addressed it that I'm aware of, it operates as a hearsay exception. Uh, the burden of proof in these hearings is a preponderance of the evidence in almost all jurisdictions. The ones where it's not are Washington State, New York State, and Maryland. Uh, California uh, operationally is preponderance, even though they're evidence code says it should be by clear and convincing evidence, but I'm told that when you're trying these cases in court, preponderance is the standard. Uh, so that's a, uh, an advantage. We just have to show that it's more likely or not that this intimidation that the offender engaged in and was intentional resulted in the witness's unavailability. Uh, and the court in most jurisdictions is not bound by the rules of evidence. It's a preliminary question under Rule 104 uh, in most uh, codes. Uh, and the rules of evidence uh, do not bind the court. That doesn't mean that the court's not re going to require that you have uh, some evidence to um, introduce or lay a foundation for uh, the evidence of intimidation, uh, but uh, they're not bound typically in most jurisdictions. Check your own code for that. Uh, and a formal proceeding need not be underway, but in most cases there's going to be a, a formal proceeding and there are going to be a witness and that's what's going to make forfeiture uh, fly. It's, it's much tougher when there isn't an ongoing proceeding to demonstrate that it was the defendant's intent to make a witness unavailable when a, a case doesn't exist that yet. But there are cases that uh, address that, and they're typically uh, cases where, say, it's a drug conspiracy and they execute uh, someone who they think is a snitch or is cooperating with the police. Forfeiture would apply. They, they made that witness unavailable to prevent them from testifying against them. All right, so when we're preparing for trial, what do we want to think about? Pre-trial litigation is going to be important in uh, a lot of these cases. We want to establish as much ahead of time as we possibly can. The, the vast majority of my domestic violence cases were misdemeanor cases in our misdemeanor court, and so we didn't have a great opportunity for pre-trial litigation, and we did a lot of it on the fly. But we had plenty of felony domestic violence cases uh, that we would do, and we would argue motions in the misdemeanor court as well. Um, ahead of trial, uh, even if it was right before trial. And that, that still gives you an idea of what your trial is going to look like or whether or not you can go for it. In, in felony cases, there's plenty of opportunity to do this ahead of time. So 404B motions. What do I know about the history of the relationship prior incidents that's relevant to this prosecution that I'm going to try and argue and get in? Let's do that ahead of time. Expert testimony. We can uh, introduce uh, the concept of using an expert ahead of time and uh, argue the motion ahead of time. Qualify our expert and tell the court the authority for this and why we're introducing it. Briefing the court on these things ahead of time is invaluable. So the court doesn't have to make a, a you know, off-the-cuff ruling. They have the authority in front of them and they know what the law is um, and they can make a, a, an informed decision about it rather than one off the cuff, particularly if you're doing something like forfeiture by wrongdoing, which may be new to a lot of courts. Um, motions to exclude inadmissible character evidence. The classic defense in these cases is to trash the victim or to harass the victim by trying to either get counseling records or uh, 
you know, they're on an anti-anxiety medicine and we have to introduce that because you can't believe somebody, even though millions of Americans are on those things, um, it has nothing to do with anything. It's sometimes just uh, meant to harass. Let's try and pr protect our victims' privacy uh, to the degree we can ahead of time. Um, we want to determine the admissibility of statements ahead of time, whether or not it's hearsay, whether it's being introduced for the truth of the matter or some other reason, or whether it's subject to a hearsay exception. And forfeiture by wrongdoing in a, a DV homicide case can obviously be done well in advance of trial. If it's not a homicide case, it might have to be done much closer to trial because the judge is going to be reluctant to rule that a witness is unavailable prior to trial because a witness may show up. And in fact, I think that as we do more and more forfeiture litigation, we're going to see the strategy shift to making the victim come and having them recant. Uh, that's what the defense will shift to. We also want to discover defenses if we're able. So pay attention to defense counsel's arguments at any hearing or at any negotiation. Interview defense witnesses if they'll talk to us. And if they don't talk to us, I can use that when I cross-examine them. Uh, that's going to go right to the heart of their credibility. And talk to investigators about what's not in the report. They can't put everything in the report. Uh, there's just too much sometimes. All right, so what are some of our trial strategies? General trial strategies that are effective in any case is developing an offender-focused theme and theory of the case. Themes are really good, and in domestic violence, the classic theme is this is not a marital squabble. This is not about an argument one day that escalated. This is about an ongoing pattern of abuse. This is about power and control, things like that. We always want to control the narrative in our cases. We want to defuse any uh, vulnerabilities in our case and keep the focus on the offender. That's what the jury needs to look at. Many of these violence against women cases are really about being on defense about victim behavior and what the victim did. Let's make sure that people are paying attention to what the offender did, too. We want to turn those perceived weaknesses into strengths. Of course, she didn't call the police those first three times. She was in love with them. She, he knew that. He was manipulating her. He was exercising power and control over her. That's what people do. Uh, and we want to have powerful closing and opening arguments that present the accurate case to the jury so they understand what's going on. Uh, we want to establish the defendant's guilt. We want to introduce all the evidence of his wrongdoing. In the case in chief, are there prior incidences? Are things that he's done in the past that uh, help us understand what happened? Is there evidence of consciousness of guilt, like intimidation, like lying to the police or fleeing the scene? Let's make sure we get that consciousness of guilt evidence in our case in chief. If we're filing a forfeiture by wrongdoing motion, then there's intimidation probably or manipulation in our case. And let's think about not just the evidence being used at the hearing on forfeiture, which is typically outside the presence of the jury. Um, maybe it can be used in the case in chief to establish consciousness of guilt as well. Jury selection is always important in these cases. We have to educate our jury. Uh, we think about trying to uncover bias, but educating the jury, this is an opportunity. Uh, do they understand that we can satisfy this crime, uh, satisfy the burdens of proof, even without the victim's testimony? Uh, do we educate them about victim behavior? Do we use the experiences of the whole jury pool to educate each other about domestic violence? There will be folks on that pool who will have experience with domestic violence. They'll have a friend or family member who is a victim of domestic violence, or they themselves might have been a victim of domestic violence. And the other members can, those people probably won't make it on the panel, but other members can hear their experiences, and so they hear it from another one, another individual besides us or an expert. Uh, the effects of trauma we need to talk about. We need to unco uncover those biases and establish empath empathy with our victim, humanize our victim, and make sure the jury can relate to our victim. Victim behavior is often the key to these cases. People don't understand why victims behave, and they suddenly don't believe them. Um, so we have to identify any victim behavior. Our victim uh, has been in an abusive relationship for 20 years and has stayed with a, an abusive individual. Is the jury going to believe that? Uh, they didn't call the police. They are minimizing the offender's abuse. They are recanting, or they are testifying on behalf of the defendant. Do they understand those things? Can we educate them about victim behavior? Is an expert the appropriate way? One way, uh, are we going to use several strategies like jury selection and use jurors' experiences? We use the victim who has gotten advocacy and counseling and support who can now explain why she did what she did. Um, are we going to be able to counter the defense arguments about credibility? So if we're going to use an expert, there are plenty of experts out there, victim advocates, scholars, psychiatrists, psychologists, law enforcement who have done these cases for years, a shelter director, um, uh, 
medical professionals like an ER doctor or a SANE nurse who have dealt with victims and can document and know how victims behave. Victim advocate is the one that I think of the most for a victim behavior expert in domestic violence. They don't think of themselves as experts, but I guarantee you they are. Uh, and they are in most every jurisdiction. So uh, they may be accessible to help uh, as an expert. Um, we typically want to use a general expert, though. Someone who has not met the victim is not diagnosing the victim as a victim of battering, knows very little about the facts of the case, if anything, and they're only educating the judge or jury on common victim behavior. So you don't want to use an advocate who's in your jurisdiction working with your victim or working in the agency that's working with your victim. You want to use an advocate from a neighboring jurisdiction. They're going to know how victims behave, and we're just going to have them testify. Are there, uh, you know, common behaviors that uh, victims of domestic violence exhibit, like uh, not reporting, staying with an abuser, recanting, minimizing? Uh, and if you have those elements in your case, an expert can explain that in a general way so that it matches up with your case and suddenly the jury understands why victims behave the way they do. Uh, this is the basic uh, federal rule for the admissibility of expert testimony. Uh, it is something that is beyond the common ken and understanding of the average juror. That's all we have to show. And jurors do not understand how domestic violence works. It's reliable. It has been backed up by study after study. We know that this is how domestic violence work and works, and we know that these uh, witnesses know what they're talking about. And it will assist the trier of fact in understanding a fact or the evidence in general, and that's certainly true in domestic violence. So that's what we have to show. Now, you do want to avoid the danger zone. Of, an expert witness cannot testify about a particular witness's credibility. I really believe this victim, she said, all these things that are classic indicators of domestic violence. Can't do that. Can't be a human lie detector test. Uh, determine whether a victim's telling the truth or whether they're lying. And you can't tell whether an assault happened or not. You're not allowed to testify about those things. Having a blind expert is the best way to do that because they're not going to meet the victim and they're not going to be able to talk about the case specifics. An area that we get into a problem with is when we're trying to establish something must have happened because they're exhibiting all these signs of trauma. So we can tell that something happened. You kind of want to avoid that. It's not necessarily impermissible, but you're creeping up against the line of impermissibility, and you want to avoid that if you can. Uh, so direct testimony, uh, usually we're pretty good at this uh, part of it. Uh, we want to prove those elements. We want to humanize the victim, make the victim relatable to our uh, fact finder, our judge or jury. We want them to be able to see, hear, feel what the victim saw, heard, and felt. We want to recreate the reality of this crime for that jury, not just make it a shove, a push, something like that, but really understand what the victim has gone through and that pattern of abuse, how that has impacted the victim, if we can. So when we have our victim present, we want to do an effective direct that fully uh, puts the case in front of the jury, all the elements of the case, puts the jury in the shoes of the uh, victim. Uh, we want to allow the victim to tell the truth in a convincing manner, and we also want to deflate any potential cross-examination. Let's cover those vulnerable areas. Uh, so it looks like the defense is just repeating themselves. Uh, we've already pulled the sting. We've already covered it. And we want to lay the foundation for a strong closing, something we can pound our fist on. Sometimes the victim's going to testify on behalf of the defendant, and that can be problematic for us. So we end up having to cross-examine the victim. We do not want to cross-examine our victim the way we would a defendant, in an aggressive way. We don't want to re-victimize our victim. They are the victim in this case. If we're victim-centered, we're always remembering the victim's well-being, their safety. And that includes what happens to them on the, on the stand. Uh, I don't want to treat a victim in such a way that that victim never calls the police again, even when they most need to. And that goes right up to cross-examination. We can do an effective job, almost a more effective job, just by demonstrating what this relationship is about. Think about the power and control wheel here, too. That can have powerful evidence of power and control of the crime that's going on in these cases. So little things like, does the defendant control the victim's paycheck? Does he isolate the victim from family and friends, any support network? network? Is he abusive toward a pet? Those little things, if we can get those into evidence through cross-examination of the victim, that can be powerful to demonstrate how much this individual controls our victim. That can be very powerful particularly when a victim's testifying on behalf of a defendant. So think about those things. Look for that little evidence that might not normally be admissible. We might get it in this way. And we, of course, want to elicit favorable testimony and develop any conflicting testimony uh, that attacks the credibility of the defendant. So usually these 
uh, can be sort of absurd defenses, and the evidence is overwhelming. But just having the victim testify for the defendant is uh, is an issue. Um, again, remember, you're the one with the power in the courtroom. You don't want to look like you're abusing somebody, and you don't want to actually re-victimize the victim, and you certainly don't want to look like you're re-victimizing the victim. So think about what we call a soft cross to get as much effective information out as possible. There's a lot of possible defenses in these cases. It didn't happen. It's just a classic where we're going to have to rely on our thorough investigation to demonstrate that, no, something clearly happened here. Uh, and so we'll just go back to those things if that's what they're going to say, even if the victim is testifying, no, it didn't happen, I made it up. Well, really, is there a good reason for you to have made it up? Uh, a detailed report about what happened, and the, the recant is really, I just made it up, I was angry, and there's no details about why they made it up. Uh, self-defense is a common one. Think about what self-defense, it requires that uh, the defendant not be the initial aggressor, that he be presented with unlawful force uh, against him, that a reasonable person would have uh, feared for their safety and responded in an appropriate way, and that the defendant actually feared for his safety, because that's where it kind of falls apart. Uh, they're not actually afraid of this individual. Um, so let's examine self-defense closely. An accident. Well, that's where that 404B evidence can come in powerfully. Oh, it was just an accident. Well, how many times has this same accident happened? Uh, how much evidence is there that it was actually an accident? Was it originally reported not as an accident, and that's now the excuse at trial? Talk about reasonable doubt, too. Don't let the defense define it. Don't let them tell the uh, jury what reasonable doubt is. We have to talk about it and make sure they understand it. There's some other defenses that just blame the victim. They argue that this is a minor thing that you shouldn't be concerned about. It's a private issue, and it, there really was no uh, real injury to the victim. Uh, they ask juries to improperly consider that the victim's not here, didn't testify. Uh, if the victim doesn't care uh, enough to show up, why should you care? Um, and jury nullification, don't ruin this guy's life over this incident or this victim that I've trashed repeatedly. So we want to anticipate all of those defenses uh, in these cases as well and make sure uh, we're on target for that. Um, so we kind of zipped through that uh, pretty quickly. There's a lot of good uh, information in there. Um, we have a lot of good resources to assist you guys on 404B motions, on forfeiture by wrongdoing motions, uh, on Crawford issues relating to non-testimonial hearsay and testimonial hearsay. So please reach out to us if you need any further information. Going forward in these cases, remember, we're going to be trauma-informed and support victim participation. The best way is for us to keep that victim engaged and uh, involved in the case. So let's give them all the support they need and give it to them as immediately as close in time to the incident as possible when they're most receptive to that help. We're going to identify and document all potential sources of corroborating evidence. The people and witnesses right on the scene, children, neighbors, uh, we're going to get medical records if we can. We're going to interview other people about the history of the relationship, everything we can to corroborate what's happening. We're going to anticipate any possible defense and prepare counter arguments, whether it's self-defense or accident or it didn't happen. Uh, any of those, we're, we're going to be ready to go. And we're going to collaborate with experts on victim behavior. Uh, they may be an important witness. They may simply help us to prepare our case, to understand the evidence, to look for additional evidence, because experts know how these cases work and know uh, what goes on with victims because they've worked with them so much. Um, okay, so that is basically uh, the presentation. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Yeah. I have a couple questions. Okay. I have a minute or two for uh, questions. How will you present an expert at bench trial and either resources brought? You can't afford an expert witness. Yeah, so how do you present uh, an expert at a bench trial? So uh, you can absolutely present an expert at a bench trial. It's no different from a jury trial. Uh, you're going to qualify the expert. Uh, you can do this ahead of trial. Um, one issue that I've seen come up is where a judge has had some training or instruction on the dynamics of domestic violence and don't think they need an expert. Don't let them get away with that. Uh, it's your case. You should be allowed to try it any way you want. You're creating a record, not just trying the case before the judge. If the case is appealed, if it's a conviction, uh, you might want to have that record, even if it's a, a bench trial, uh, and that's an import, important piece of evidence. So you're going to present it the same way. Uh, as you would uh, to a jury. Obviously, you might do more of a dog and pony show in front of a jury, but uh, again, I have a qualified expert. This is beyond the average tenant understanding of the average juror. Even if your judge knows a little more, I'm also creating my record uh, 
so please don't prevent me from creating my record. I want to present this witness. Unless you find the witness unqualified or the area of testimony uh, not to be the subject, the proper subject of expert testimony, which it absolutely is, and we can help you research uh, your jurisdiction's case law, um, that uh, that should be allowed to come in, whether it's bench or, or jury. And are there resources available when an office cannot afford an expert witness? So you might have to use other strategies like jury selection. Um, you might have to use analogies and argument. You might have to use the victim's testimony themselves to explain why they did what they did. Sometimes a police officer can sneak in a little bit of expert testimony. Uh, why did you uh, refer this witness to advocacy right away? Um, well, I know that uh, victims of domestic violence suffer a lot of trauma as a result of domestic violence, and they require the support of advocacy to understand what's going on, to help them get through it, things like that. Uh, most jurisdictions that are working with advocates should have advocates who can testify. Usually they're going to do it without requiring a fee, uh, particularly if they're in a neighboring jurisdiction nearby. Uh, and so they're a very effective way, an affordable way, to get that expert testimony before the court, before the judge, or before the jury. So um, there are other strategies we can help you with if you cannot afford to call an expert, or if the case law in your jurisdiction does not support calling an expert. We can do that research for you, too. But we'll work with you to figure out a way to get that testimony before your court, if it's at all possible. Thank you, John, and thank you everyone who's called in and logged in today. Um, we have recorded this, so we you can use use the recording link that I'll be sending out afterwards um, to refer back and share with colleagues. Again, um, we will be sending the PowerPoint slides, and and I will be sending that in an email as well. So thank you again for your participation. Um, remember that Equitas is a 24-7 technical assistance provider available to respond to your questions and concerns and training needs. For those of you who did ask questions that we didn't quite get to, um, I will have John follow up with you. And please feel free to uh, check in with us if you have any specific questions. Thank you again, and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.